Okay, everybody, assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to uh, study GIT pharmacology and now we are going to cover up the subtopic of upper GIT disorders. Now, when I say upper and lower GIT disorders, so that means that this is the entire length of GIT. So I would cut it up into half, isn't it? Okay. And when we are going to, we, we are saying that we are cutting this GIT into half, that means that we are bifurcating it somewhere here. Uh, when we are looking at the upper half, so we would have stomach and esophagus, right? Okay. <clears throat> so that means when we are talking about the GIT, specifically upper GIT, that means that we are going to talk about the stuff that's going to hamper uh, the stomach. We are going to fix that thing and the esophagus, right? Okay, so let's study. So that means, you see, in stomach acid is produced, right? So stomach is the main target organ which we'll be covering today. Okay. Uh, when we're talking about stomach, so in that we have acid. So you see, excessive acid is also a problem. Uh, damage of mucous membrane and then ulcers being happening, that's also a problem. So we are going to focus on these, that how would we protect our upper GID tract from these uh, kind of situations. In order to protect our body from these situations, we take an acid and acids, we take gastric acid inhibitors, we take protective agents. So one by one, I'm going to cover up all of these. Starting with, okay. So the goal of these drugs, the goal of these drugs would be, uh, like I said just now, that we are going to cover up the uh, acidic situation. That means ulcers we are going to cover up. And the acidity, when we feel that the acidic reflex is there, right, in the form of vomiting or something, we are going to discuss that. So that damage of the mucus, you see over here, this is the mucus. Uh, and this gets uh, damaged or corroded away. And here, the acid would directly touch the muscle, right? So that's, that's when the pinching effect is there. And that's when it, get, it hurts very badly, okay? So we are, going to, we are going to study today how to fix this issue. That when mucus layer is not there, so how we are going to protect our stomach from the acidic attack. And we are going to study how exactly the GERD, that is uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease, how we are going to prevent that, okay? You see here, this is a healthy stomach. So acid is not being able to enter into the esophagus. But when somebody has GERD, so at that moment, the sphincter is not being able to close or shut down properly. And that's why acidic reflex is there. So our goal is to reduce gastric acid production to neutralize gastric pH or to protect the walls of the stomach from the acid and peptin relief by the stomach. Okay, we are going to study that. So the first thing would be antacids. As you see here in this picture here of this man, the man is holding a screen kind of a thing and there's a fire, okay? So the fire is actually indicating as if this is some kind of uh, intense acidic situation the person is suffering from. And of course, it's an unease, right? When we eat a lot, we do experience this issue, right? Especially when we eat the meaty stuff. So what is the general characteristic of it? And acids are weak bases. You see, when somebody has eaten a lot and a lot of acidic situation is there in the stomach, okay? Uh, so, of course, to neutralize an acid, I'll be using a base, right? So, and acids are weak bases taken orally, partially neutralize gastric acid, reduce pepsin activity. Why reduce pepsin activity? Because you see, pepsin is an enzyme. And this pepsin works best when the pH is acidic. All of the enzymes that are in our body, 
they have a specific pH at which they would work. That is why the enzymes which are present in our mouth that are there in the neutral pH, they won't work that way in the stomach. Okay. They would get deactivated and they would get denatured even. Right? So, when you are using a weak base, that means you are uh, prohibiting pepsin to do its action. Right? Now, stimulate pro, uh, prostaglandin production and reduce the pain associated with ulcers and may promote healing. And acids have been largely replaced for GID disorders by other drugs, but are used commonly by patients as non-prescription remedies for dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is the uneasy uh, feeling caused due to acidic situation. Right, everybody? So now we are going to study how and which and acids do we use despite we are saying that we are using them over the counter only and this class is being heavily replaced but still we have to study okay okay now you see when we talk about classification of and acids okay so here we have three major classes which is systemic non-systemic complex complex means that a combination of these would be there in this formula right when we talk about systemic it means that these would get absorbed in blood all right and when we talk about non-systemic, it means that these will not get absorbed in their blood. Which blood? Blood of GIs. Okay. Now, when we talk about systemic, <coughs> systemic uh, and acids, so that includes sodium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate, sodium citrate. Non-systemic includes magnesium hydroxide, aluminium hydroxide, aluminium phosphate. Complex include uh, megaldrate, L-megate, hydrocelcite. Now talking about systemic and acids. Systemic and acids, these are the prototype agents, means they are the uh, in the most simple of the forms. So these are sodium bicarbonate and calcium carbonate. I tell you what, whenever there is acidic environment, okay, even generally, uh, uh, for example, if a soil gets acidic, so you to put calcium carbonate in it, okay? And similarly, we also take those, um, those pills that we usually take, they also are made up of these carbonates and bicarbonates. Now, the thing is this, these carbonates and bicarbonates, they of course react with the acid and then they neutralize. And when they neutralize, acid and base, so obviously neutralization reaction would happen. What would be produced? See, carbonate and bicarbonate is there. So whenever carbonates are there or bicarbonates are there, we are sure that carbon dioxide gas would be produced. Right? And when gas would be produced as a result, then definitely it has to come out of your mouth. Right? It won't stay or get accumulated within your body. So that effect of having the gas out from your mouth is called bletching, right? So it may cause nausea and bletching, okay? Some unreacted carbonate and bicarbonate is absorbed systemically and can cause metabolic alkalosis. What is metabolic alkalosis? I'll discuss in my next slide. They should not be used for long-term treatment. Sodium bicarbonate is contraindicated at hypertension, heart failure, and venial failure because its high sodium content can increase fluid retention. Similarly, uh, calcium carbonate may stimulate gastrin release and thereby cause rebound acid production. Uh, how this gastrin would uh, promote Acidic production, I have a slide in which I will tell you. First of all, let's talk about metabolic alkalosis. What is that? If you look over here, we usually say that the pH would be increased. When we say increased, that means it will become more than 7. And when it's more than 7, that means it will become basic in nature. That means your blood 
will get basic in nature. So as a result, what, what will happen is confusion, <coughs> nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors, muscle cramps, tingling of fingers and toes, hypokalemia, restlessness followed by lethargy, dysrhythmia, tachycardia. Tachycardia, I'm sure you know what is that. Uh, compensatory hypoventilation and uh, the causes would be severe vomiting. Okay, you, we are not discussing causes here because right now we are focusing on this particular class of drug, right? So you see over here, sodium bicarbonate and calcium carbonate in presence of dairy products containing calcium can cause hyperkalemia and metabolic alkalosis with renal insufficiency. And this particular scenario is called milk alkali syndrome. Right, everybody? And when metabolic alkalosis would happen, then of course all of these symptoms would happen, right? Okay. Then let's talk about the non-systemic class of this drug. When we are saying non-systemic, it means that these will not get absorbed from the GIT, right? No systemic effects, that means, means at a, a metabolic alkalosis cannot happen by it, right? Okay, so talking about magnesium hydroxide, it is not absorbed by GIG tract and therefore does not produce systemic effects. This agent can be used for long-term therapy. The most frequent adverse effect associated is diarrhea. Coming up to aluminum hydroxide, uh, it causes constipation. This is the only uh, adverse effect we have with it. When we talk about complex and acids, like I said before, it's a combination. So combination products combine magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide to achieve a counteracting balance between each agents. Adverse effects on the bowel. Because you see, one is causing diarrhea, other is causing constipation, so they can uh, manage each other, right? Okay, drug interactions. So, and acids alter the bioavailability of many drugs by the following mechanism. The increase in gastric pH produced by end acid decreases the absorption of acidic drugs and increases the absorption of basic drugs. When I'm saying increase in gastric pH, it does not mean that it is getting more acidic. When I say the pH number is getting increased, it means that it is getting pH 7 and above. That means it is getting basic, not more acidic, okay? So when it's becoming more acidic, so as a result, the there would be, uh, what happened? The absorption would be uh, hampered, right? Now, metal ion in some preparation can chelate other drugs. What is chelation? Chelation is forming up the complex, right? So it means that if you're taking digoxin or tetracycline with an acid, so they would form chelate and none of the drugs would produce the action and they would be eliminated by the body just like that without producing any effect at all. And so then their absorption, like I said, Chelation when they will be there, so obviously no absorption at all would happen. Now the second thing is gastric acid inhibitors. Now we'll discuss about how acid is, acid is produced in the stomach and everything. So, first of all, I want you all to please look over here. So, this is a cell by which, uh, this is, you can say, a cross-sectional diagram of the cells which are present in the stomach okay so this is called the pits by which uh, the uh, the the chemicals which are produced they're released here okay and since we're talking about the acid production so we are not going to talk about what what is producing mucus what is producing xyz we are more concerned towards the parietal cells because they are the one which are producing acid. Okay, here, acid. So let's talk about how exactly these parietal cells work. You see, these cells in the stomach have these receptors on top of it. Acetylcholine, histamine, gastrin. It means that if you're taking 
S cholinomimetic drug or histaminic drug or any drug which is promoting gastrin. So as a result, the parietal cell will be stimulated and more and more of the acid would be produced. When we talk about parietal cell, what happens in here is this, that water and carbon dioxide, both of these get combined in the presence of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Now this carbonic anhydrase forms bicarbonate and then this bicarbonate is being broken down into a proton and bicarbonate ion. What happens is bicarbonate ion goes into the blood and then it sends the signals to our brain for oxygen, right? But we are not concerned about what exactly bicarbonate ion is doing. We are more concerned about how hydrogen is released. So if you see over here, when bicarbonate ion is getting out through the same pump, chlorine is getting entered, right? Now this ion would pass the parietal cell and enter into the lumen of gastric pit. Lumen means hole of gastric pit. Gastric pit are the small, small circles in the stomach, okay, which release these uh, acid and other, other things, right? Okay, so we got, we usually say that HCl is there in our stomach, so we got from where Cl is coming into our stomach, right? Now let's talk about the proton. So if you see over here, this proton passes um, like goes out of the parietal cell and enters into the lumen of gastric pit through proton pump, right? And this proton pump uses energy, right? See here, ATP is being converted into ADP, so it is using energy, right? At the same time when proton is getting out, potassium is pumped in and then it is pumped out again by this pump, right? Okay. So as a result, we can see here H positive and Cl negative is here. And now we can say that we know how exactly HCl is produced, which is released in our stomach. Right, everybody? I have just learned how exactly stomach gets HCl in it. Now, if I want to learn how to get rid of HCl production. So definitely, I will block acetylcholine, I will block histamine, I will block the gastrin pump, I will block the proton pump, right? Or maybe even I can block this uh, enzyme, right? I can do various things. This class, in this class, we will be discussing about the histamine H2 receptor antagonist, right? And later on, we will discuss proton pump inhibitor, which means that here of immense importance would be that why don't we block this and why don't we block this? And when we are saying histamine, it means that this is H2, right? Okay. Now talking about H2 receptor antagonism. So the drugs are cimetidine, canetidine, famotidine, and nizatidine. Again, guys, uh, I think um, literally save the names of uh, these medicines in your phone list with your friends' names, okay? Um, for example, if somebody has the name of, uh, starting with F.A., or somebody has a name which starts with an, an I. So just replace their names with the drug's name and it will be really easy for you to remember names of these drugs. Okay, so what you, you have in here is this. These are competitive inhibitors of histamine H2 receptor on the parietal cell. This results in a marked decrease in histamine stimulated gastric acid production and therapeutic use of course when acid will be released decreased. Uh, so what will happen? It will treat septic 
ulcer disease. It will, it will treat GERD. It will treat stress-related gastritis. Gastritis means inflammation, right? And non-ulcer-related dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is the pain which is there in the stomach, right? Except for the later condition, their use has been mostly supplanted by proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, right? Okay. Now, uh, talking more about it, okay? So they are associated with low incidence of mild GI upset and headache. Confusion happens when you administer simitidine in the elderly patient through the IV route, right, everybody? This also um, is a, a, a androgen receptor antagonist and can induce gynecomastia in impotence. Gynecomastia is a condition in the male where their chest is enlarged in a way that it looks like uh, a mammary gland has been developed, okay? And impotence means that they, they become infertile. Simitidine competes with other drugs for metabolism by cytochrome P450. Um, and then as a result, you see, remember when we were uh, discussing the metabolism and everything in the earlier classes when we were do, discussing basics? So we discussed that cytochrome, uh, cytochrome P50, they <laughs> metabolize bar, uh, warfarin, theophylin, and all these drugs. So of course, these drugs would be affected, right? Now, ranitidine, famotidine, and nizatidine uh, do not bind to androgen receptor. Their effect on drug metabolism is negligible. Uh, coming up to proton pump inhibitors, okay, the one which are blocking up the pump. Now, they are covalent irreversible inhibitors of the pump in parietal cell as lipophilic. Weak bases, these orally administered the, uh, delayed release prodrugs to protect against their destruction by gastric acid concentrate in the acidic compartments of the parietal cells, right? There they are rapidly converted to an active cation which forms a covalent disulfate linkage with the pump that results in it inactivation and thereby blocking the transport of acid from the cell into the lumen, right? These agents reduce both male stimulated and basal acid secretion. Desired effects may take three to four days since not all proton pump inhibitors are uh, inhibited. Uh, not all pumps are inhibited with the first dose of these medications. Now, Talking about their bioavailability, so uh, it, it is decreased significantly by food, so you should take it before one hour of taking meals. These agents are most effective drugs for treatment of all forms of GERD. Uh, PPI is administered with antibiotics and perhaps uh, bismuth subsalicate are preferred for the treatment of uh, uh, helicobacter, I, I tell you what is this? This is a bacteria, okay? And this actually creates the ulcer, right? So if you have an ulcer, which is due to this thing, so you know, uh, along with the proton pump inhibitor, you are also taking an antibiotic, okay? So you're doing two things at a time. These agents are used to heal ulcer caused by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug therapy. Uh, basically, there is a complete class of NSAIDs, which you would be studying in the upcoming classes. But I tell you briefly, for example, aspirin, okay? What it does is this, if you start taking aspirin, so it will create ulcer, right? So in order to protect the stomach from it, you have to take care of it. Okay? So omeprazole by oral or IV administration is FDA approved to reduce stress-related mucosal bleeding. These agents are useful in patients with untreatable hyperacid secreting gastrinomas. Omas means tumor, okay? Adverse effects include headaches and GI disturbances. The reduction in acid products may 
permit bacterial overgrowth with increased incidence of respiratory and enteric infection. What is this? I tell you. Here, we are saying that the acidity would be reduced in everything. Right? Now, bacteria, they are killed in our stomach because of the acidic environment. Now, when we are uh, diminishing acidic secretion into our stomach, so what would happen? A lot of bacteria can flourish within our stomach and that's why respiratory and enteric infections can happen. Why respiratory? Because right, right next to esophagus, there is trachea, right? And even the openings are almost the same. It's just a flap which covers up and makes the bolus go into the esophagus and avoids it being fallen out into the windpipe, right? So infection can easily happen if we are reducing the acidic environment of the stomach. Now, protective agents. What is protective agents? For example, if we are going to protect mucous membrane from being scared up, or if it's scared up, so what are we going to do? We are going to study that. So these are the drugs which we can use as protective agents. The first one is uh, sacral fate. So it is a polysaccharide complex with aluminum hydroxide and has a particular affinity for exposed proteins in the crater of duodenal ulcers. It protects ulcerated areas from further damage and promotes healing. These uh, stimulate mucosal production of prostaglandins and inhibit pepsin. What is pepsin? It is the enzyme, right? It is used in critical care setting to prevent stress-related bleeding and this produces constipation and nausea. Misoprostol, it is an analog of prostaglandin E1 that acts in the GIT to stimulate bicarbonate and mucus production. It is used rarely to reduce the incidence of stress-related bleeding due to its adverse effect profile and its dosing schedule of four times daily. Uh, right, everybody, thank you so much.